one Ezekiel, Emmanuel, and one Cruz all looked like criminals. They'd spent each of them many years in gangs. They had the, the tats to prove it, and they had scars on their bodies. So when you saw these guys coming, you were a little bit nervous, but they each had a head-on collision with Jesus. And he was radically changing them from the inside out. And they got involved in a recovery ministry. And part of their ministry was to, to make and then sell baked goods. And as people would buy from their stand, they would ask them if they'd like to hear about Jesus. And these guys would share their stories about how Jesus came into their lives and radically changed them. Well, one morning, they were getting ready to set up their stand, and they didn't have enough gas to get where they needed to go, so they stopped in a gas station, they, they fueled the car up, and after they fueled the car up, it wouldn't start. So imagine this picture, four big, burly, criminal-looking guys, and they are push-starting a car. Well, the local police saw that scene, and and they came over and began asking them questions. Well, Emmanuel owned the car, but he didn't have all the current paperwork in his car. So the police arrested them. They threw them in jail. They took all their baked goods away, and they impounded the car. Now, the thing that made them notice them was because of what they looked like. Now, just pause for a second. Let the feeling of that soak in. How would you feel if somebody thought badly of you just because of how you looked? And maybe even you got thrown into jail just because of how you looked. Well, Dave Roberts is the leader of this particular ministry. He was out of, out of a country at the time. This, this ministry takes place in Argentina, by the way. He was out of country. But he called a lawyer friend of his, and, and the lawyer friend went down and got them out of jail. But they were in jail for four days. The police ran, were running background checks on them. Now, I don't know about you, but I've had background checks done, and it might take 15 minutes, and if they do an elaborate one, it might take two hours, but it's not a very big deal. But see, in Argentina, the police, all they have to do is think that there might be something wrong, and they have the freedom to just take you, take your stuff, put you in jail. How would you feel if that was you? Well, when Dave Roberts got back and the guys got bailed out of jail, he asked them how they were doing. And I just want to read what Emmanuel said as a, re as a result of their experience. He said, it was bad that we were arrested, but at the same time, we had the opportunity to share our testimonies with all the people in our jail cell. We told them about Jesus Christ's work in our lives and we prayed with them to accept Christ. Would that have been the reaction you would have? I mean, think about it. These guys did not call a press conference. They didn't call a lawyer. They didn't get upset. They didn't scream and holler and fight. They didn't do any of that. Instead, what they did was they saw themselves as servants of Christ. They knew that Jesus owned them and so that wherever they went, it was because Jesus sent them there. And they were going to be faithful to him to share the message that he had for them to give. They belonged to him. And so he's the one who got to call the shots in their lives. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. If you want to use one of the Bibles in the pew right in front of you, you want to turn to page 815. Ephesians chapter 3. And, and an interesting thing that happens here is Paul begins by, by saying this of himself. He says in verse 1, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of the Gentiles. Paul identifies himself as a prisoner for Christ. In, in the, the, the short, really kind of postcard of, of, of Philemon, this is how he introduces himself again. He says, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus. 
Paul saw himself as Christ's prisoner. He was a prisoner of Christ. Now, we all know that physically he was a prisoner of Rome. But here's the thing we need to realize. Is that Paul was not a prisoner of Rome because he did anything wrong. Paul was a prisoner of Rome because he was a prisoner of Christ. Because he followed after Jesus, he was willing to be a prisoner and did not blame the authorities. He did not throw a fit. He didn't call a press conference. He didn't hire a lawyer. He went where God sent him and he shared the good news of who Jesus is. And interestingly enough, as you read through some of the books of, of Paul, in the end, and I believe it's a book of Romans. I didn't think of it till just now, so you'll have to check my reference here. He talks about people, members from the household of Caesar greeting these fellow believers. Now, how would members of the household of Caesar hear about Christ and come to know Christ? Because Paul was a prisoner of Christ for the Gentiles. So that whenever he was in prison or wherever he was, he was constantly sharing the good news of who Jesus is and what Jesus wanted him to do. Unjustly accused, locked up, but he was there because Jesus wanted him there at that place in that time. You and I are where God wants us because there's somebody who needs to hear about the grace of God. Somebody who needs to know that, that, that even when somebody like you or me is being treated improperly, maybe mistreated, maybe even, even hurt for what we believe in, that we are not going to be angry and defiant and hateful, but that instead we're going to see that as an opportunity to get into a situation with somebody we would never be able to speak to and share the gospel of Jesus. God's plan to cover the world with his grace is unlimitable. There are no limits that can be put on it at all. Paul was in prison, but that didn't discourage him and it didn't keep him quiet. Juan, Ezekiel, Emmanuel, and Juan Cruz were wrongly accused and locked up for four days. No provocation, no evidence, no crime committed, and not even a threat of a crime being committed. And instead of feeling the injustice of it all, they realized that they were prisoners of Christ. And they were there to share God's grace. God entrusts us, his grace recipients, to become grace bearers so that wherever he wants us to go, wherever he sends us, we bear the message of grace. Look at verse 2. And Paul says, he continues on, um, you know, I'm the prisoner for Christ on behalf of you Gentiles assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you so a stewardship is is something that is entrusted to somebody to manage basically he's a manager and what God has done is he's he's given him this message this message of grace that he's taking to the Gentiles and he's going to tell us more about it and he's saying that God gave this to me so that I could share it with you so that wherever I go, whatever I do, I want to be faithful. I want to manage God's grace faithfully. And that's what he challenges us to do. You see, this, this, this stewardship, he'll describe it as a mystery in a little while, was entrusted to him. It was also entrusted to the apostles and prophets, and it's entrusted to us. So that we understand that the, the example set by Paul is one that we are to follow. To follow after him so that God can reveal through us to the world the grace that he has for us. Look at verse 3. How the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. When you read this, 
or you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations that has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So, Paul had already been telling them about this mystery. Uh, Pastor Levi preached last week from chapter 2, verse 11 to 22. And in that, he was, he was describing to them this mystery. The mystery was all about Gentiles who were far from God. They weren't given the promises. They weren't given the covenant. And Jews who had the opportunity to be close to God, they were given the promises and they were given the covenant. And the mystery that Paul is to steward is that God was working in Christ and through Christ to bring the two into one people. And the really cool thing about it is you have Gentiles and Jews coming together. And what he says near the end of that section of Scripture in chapter 2 is that they are becoming a place of worship for God. Now, as individual followers of Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, and, and Peter tells us that we're supposed to offer up sacrifices of praises of, of pure lips. But Paul said back in chapter 2 of this chapter that it's not just individuals, but there's a community that's growing. We are that community. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation, Gentile, Jew, we all come together under the blood of Jesus. And because of the resurrection and the spirit that lives inside of us, he gives us new life and forms us into a brand new community, a community of grace. Because we have received his grace and we bear his grace. And it shows up as a community as we come together and the way we treat one another and as we go out of these door, doors into our communities, into our homes, into our neighborhoods, into our places of business, and we bear his grace to other people and allow them to see what God is all about because of what he's done in us wherever he takes us. What a shock. Gentiles and Jews did not get along. The, the, the Jewish people did not even like the Samaritan people who were half-breeds from their perspective. The, they, they were the Jewish people who were left behind in the land of Israel during the exile. And they intermarried with the people there. So they were kind of a half-breed. And so they, they didn't even really get along with, with the Samaritans. Do you remember the story in John chapter 4 where Jesus and the disciples were walking through Samaria, which was a scandalous thing anyway, and they go into town to get some food, and Jesus stops at a well, and a woman comes out, and he talks to her, and they carry on this conversation, and the disciples come back out of the city, and they see Jesus and this woman having a conversation, and, and what must have been running through their mind was, why is he speaking to that Samaritan because that's how they referred to one another. It's a scandalous thing that Gentile and Jew are now one new community. It's a new community that's, that's built by grace, um, joined together by grace, and lives out of the awesome truth of grace. Members of the same body, partakers of the same promise. Verse 6 says, This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the same promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now let me be clear here. Gentile believers do not become Israel. Israel is, is God's distinct people. What Jesus did here was he, he built something brand new something that had never existed before. He didn't wipe out Israel. You can read Romans 9, 10, and 11 and see that God actually put Israel on the shelf because of their unbelief, and God is going to deal with the nation of Israel again in the future. But right now, he, he built this brand new community, Jews and Gentiles together, people of every tribe, tongue, and nation called the church. And we get to be part of something that is incredible, 
And God gave Paul. He gave Juan, Ezekiel, Emmanuel, Juan Cruz, and he gives us the opportunity to not just keep that community in one place, but to infect or virus our neighbors, our co-workers, our friends with his grace. That's what we get to be involved in. Now, he was entrusted with this mystery so that he could take the message to the Gentiles all across the world. Look at verse 7. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. The power that he's talking about is the grace that was given to him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. He takes this mystery, this thing that had never been known before, always the way people thought was Gentiles and Jews, they're separate. Jews have the covenant, Jews have the promise, Gentiles, well, they're outside. You think about even just the, the outlay of the tabernacle or the temple. The largest court there is the court of the Gentiles, where people from all over the world were supposed to come and worship. But guess what? They could never go into the court of the Jews because they were separate. So when Jesus came and he ripped the veil in half as we studied a couple weeks ago, he not only gave us access to God, but he was saying, I am creating a brand new community. This community of grace, where grace is going to bind you together, no matter your backgrounds, no matter your differences, no matter how you feel about each other, no matter what you think about somebody else, when you come to, to, to Jesus together by faith, acknowledging your sin and putting your faith and trust in what Jesus did for you on the cross, all the barriers go away. In Christ, Galatians says, there is no longer any Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave or free, but we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, God sent Paul on his mission all across the world. He sent him as a prisoner, as a bearer of grace. He sent him in, on stormy seas. He sent him to be shipwrecked. He, he set him into a prison where he was sitting in a dank and dark and damp, smelly prison chain to a sweaty, smelly, and probably cantankerous guard. Imagine again. What would you feel like if that was you? I mean, you're, you're out there telling people good news. You're telling people that Jesus loves you. God loves you. And Jesus came to give you new life in God. To change you. To make you a better person. And for that, he gets thrown in prison. For that, he gets shipwrecked. For that, he gets beaten. For that, he gets all those things going on. What kind of person would put up with that? Even goofier question is how would you react to that emotionally? I mean, you'd have to be sort of crazy after going through something like that, public beating, humiliation, to actually sing and to praise the God who put you in that situation, right? You'd have to be a little bit off, off center, right? This is what happened in Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas had been through something exactly like that. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. So these two men lived for God, and everyone around them was the audience. Everyone around them got to see. See, I think that's really critical for us to keep in mind. People are watching us. If we say that we believe God is sovereign and He is our Lord and we've experienced His grace and we trust Him and we say we love Him, you're a good, good Father. That's who you are. 
and I'm loved by you. Do we believe that? If we believe that, then we have to come to the place where we acknowledge that wherever our good, good Father sends us, that's where He wants us. And He may have somebody there who needs to hear the message of grace that no one else will tell them. Wherever He sent them, even if it's at the whim of someone who's intended to harm them, they went willingly. Why was that? Because to them, life is mission. It wasn't about a job. It was about the grace that he entrusted to them. Because he wanted them to bear his grace somewhere else. And so they saw from the time they got up to the time they laid their head on the bed, on the pillow that God had a mission for them God had a plan for them nothing ever escaped his notice he always had a purpose he always had a reason even if we don't get it look at what God did though this is back in Acts chapter 16 and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Stop there for a second. Think about about this. Now, in prison, my understanding, at least what I see in movies, The people in charge have to establish themselves as the authority. So when these guys check into his hotel, the jailer, the guy who's in charge of all of it, wants to make sure they know who's boss. So he probably personally clapped them in shackles. He probably personally made sure to get right in their face and tell them what the rules of this place were probably emphasizing it with a punch or two, maybe a, maybe a lick from his whip. That's the guy that Paul says, don't, don't harm yourself. We're all still here. He didn't see the jailer as his enemy. He saw the jailer as a pawn of the enemy. He saw the jailer as someone who needed God's grace. There's not a person in your life or my life who don't need to know the Jesus you know. There's not a person that you will come across today, tomorrow, or the rest of the week who don't need God's grace. I know I need it every single day. We all need to remember that we are who we are because of the grace of God. And the biggest grace that he's given us is not just our own salvation, but to take that grace and bear it to somebody else. Even when somebody is defiant to us, hateful to us, angry at us because of Jesus They need grace. And God is putting us in a situation with them where we will be able to share that grace. Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Here's a guy who had beaten them, put them in their place, He had been unnerved by these two men who did not fight back or lash out. He had been undone by the songs of praise that they sang to their God who put them in this horrid place. And it was all because of the grace of God that Jesus sent them there. Because they're God's servants. 
they're God's prisoners. Wherever God sent them, they went bearing the message that God was in Christ, reconciling everyone, Jew and Gentile alike, to himself. Sometimes, we get caught up in wondering what in the world our purpose in life is. What better purpose would there be than for us to, to let other people know that God doesn't hate them, but God loves them, and that he sent Jesus so that they could be reconciled to him and have a personal, intimate relationship with him? That is a reason to live. Life is mission. God's grace is not limited. When we suffer, when we're persecuted, or we find ourselves in unpleasant places through no doing of our own, He is gracing you and me with the opportunity to partner with Him, to bear His grace into the life of someone that we would not normally be able to touch. Now think about this. Who was really the prisoner? It was the jailer. He was locked away. There's no way in the world Paul would have ever been able to talk to this guy. It says in the passage that he pulled, he drew his sword and was going to run himself through because as a Roman soldier, if your charge got away, they would require your life. This guy knew his life was over. But his whole life was about that prison and, and carrying out his duty. He wouldn't be out wandering the streets listening to the street preachers. But God loved him. And so he sent Paul to him to share Jesus with him. There's not a person out there that's beyond God's reach. There's not a person out there who is too bad, sunk too low. You think of the person that grates on your last nerve. Think about it. Bring them to mind. <laughs> They're not beyond the reach of God's grace. Not beyond the reach of God's grace. And we get to be part of that. So much bigger than anything we could ever have imagined. God's grace is not limited. And neither will God's grace bearers be limited. Back in March of this year, we studied Matthew chapter 16. And in Matthew chapter 16, Peter makes this incredible statement. Jesus asked them, who do people say that I am? And they gave several answers. And he looked at them and he said, who do you say that I am? And this is what Peter said. He said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And after that statement of affirming who Christ is, Jesus says, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not withstand its assault. The gates of Hades will not withstand its assault. Now, he said that in a place called Caesarea Philippi. I'm just rehearsing this for those who are here in March, so it'll sound a little bit familiar. Caesarea Philippi, had a, at a place that they called the Gates of Hades. Um, it was a, a huge rock formation, and in the rock formation there were little, little indents where they would take the icons of their different little gods, the little bitty ones, and put them in there. But they were terrified of the place because they believed that Pan, one of the most powerful fertility gods, and all the other fertility gods actually lived in the base of this thing where there was this massive... Um, fountain that came out of it and it was so deep they couldn't plumb the depths of it so they thought it was the, the mouth way to hell and that every, every fall Pan and the other fertility gods would go down in there and every spring they would come back out of, out of there and so Jesus is not some, some people think that he says on this rock I'll build my church some people think it's Peter he's saying that, that Peter is the rock that they, he's going to build his church on and some people think that it's the statement that he made you know, you're the Christ, son of the living God. I don't think it's either of those things. I think he's saying, I'm taking you guys to the worst place on earth. 
And I'm saying to you that I will build my church here and the gates of hell will not be able to withstand its assault. When we think of warfare, when we think of fighting, when we think of armies and we think of all that, we think of guns and, and knives and bombs and tanks and fighter jets and drones and all kinds of things. But Jesus' war is waged with, with a couple of simple tools. Faith, love, and grace. We wage war by taking the grace in us, going where God tells us, and bearing testimony of the grace to someone else who needs it. That's what Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter 16. We live in an ever-increasingly sinful country. It amazes me how quickly we are spiraling down this rabbit hole. And we could be discouraged. We could be upset. We could fight to pass legislation, and I, I definitely think we need to do what we're supposed to do as citizens. But what Jesus said in Matthew 16 is still true today. This is the kind of time where the church of Jesus Christ shines the brightest. And how does that happen? By you and me bearing His grace to a world who needs to know. He sends us as his prisoners. A couple other places, he, Paul describes himself as a servant of, of Christ. He sends us as those who serve him, who share his message, and we get to be part of helping other people understand who God is. He sends us out to hell's strongholds. Not because he's mad at us, Not because he hates us, not because we did wrong, but because there are people who need to know him. There is someone who needs his grace. And the only way we can be limited as the bearers of his grace is if we forget who we are. His grace bearers, sent to take his grace everywhere. Everywhere he sends us to everyone he sends us. Is there someone in your life that you know today needs God's grace? Saul, the foremost persecutor of the church, he jailed them, he put them to death. He did everything in his power to disrupt the work that God was doing in their lives. Saul became Paul, wrote 13 books in the New Testament. He's the subject what we're, of the that we're talking about today. He became Paul after he was immersed in God's grace. But Paul's past was never far from his mind. I mean, he was thinking, if God can reach someone as far from himself as me, then he can reach anyone. Verse 8 says, To me, though I am the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Paul could not imagine anyone being any further from the grace of God than him. And if God's grace was strong enough to reach him, he can reach anyone. Now, here's the point that we need to grasp and apply to ourselves. This is where Paul moves from preaching to meddling. God's grace sent Paul to prison. God's grace sent Paul to prison. God's grace sent Juan, Ezekiel, Emmanuel, and Juan Cruz to jail. God's grace sent my friend Jim Tilden to the ER for a couple days stay in the hospital because there were nurses and doctors who needed to hear of the grace of Jesus and he gladly shared it. God's grace sent me to Alaska last week 
four airplane rides, two up and two back, to sit me next to different people that I would have opportunity to share about the grace of God. Now, it helps a little bit when I'm thinking about the sermon I'm going to be preaching. I don't always think this way, right? But this is, a, this is why we go through a book like Ephesians to remind us why we're here. We get to be part of this as a community. Can you imagine that there's anyone in the golden community who needs to know the grace of God? Do you have a neighbor who needs to know the grace of God? Do you have a coworker? Do you have a member of your family? Do you have someone that, that does some club or sport or whatever with you that needs to know of his grace? I think God wants to remind us that that's why we're here. So God's grace sent our friend Lacey to prison for something she did not do. And she lives as grace. God's grace might send you to the cancer clinic. God's grace may send you to King Supers this week. God's grace may send you to a neighbor's home after you hear about their loss. Or maybe you find out about a need they have. And he'll send you to their front door. God's grace will cause you to make eye contact with a homeless person and prompt you to give them something to eat. When we remember that we are who we are because God graced us, then it reminds us and challenges us to be grace to others. Whenever we forget and we get self-righteous and we get angry and we get frustrated. May God remind us the old saying, there but the grace of God, of the grace of God go I. If it weren't for his grace, I would not be where I'm at. And what better messenger than someone who understands that they've been graced by God? God graced Paul so that he could bring his grace to everyone. God graced you and me so that we could bring his grace to everyone he brings us into contact with today, tomorrow, the rest of this week. But not just, and this is where Ephesians has kind of been been peppering some of what it's been saying so far, and it's going to get really strong in the last chapter. But there's another audience that we need to be aware of that God is concerned for. God wants this other audience to understand his grace because they don't get it right now. And the reality is, they won't get it. But he wants them to know because it's a testimony against them. It's not just for the people of this world. This other audience needs to understand God's grace is unlimited and unconquerable when we walk in it. Verse 10 says, So that through the church, through us, this community of grace, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. You ever wonder who those people are? Who those beings are? Who are these rulers and authorities in the heavenly places? I'm not telling you. Not till later. But it's good. The question I want to ask, though, about this passage is, why was this so important? Because there's a theme that Paul is weaving throughout the entire book. He he says it back in chapter 1 and verse 10. He says um, that his overall purpose is to unite all things in Jesus, things in heaven and things on earth. And so he circles back in this passage to that purpose in verse 11. This was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what he's talking about is uniting all things under Christ. All the people of the earth and all these spiritual beings in the heavenly places who we'll learn about later. All things, people on earth, rulers, authorities in heaven, everything and everyone united under Christ. And that is the mystery that was revealed to Paul. 
uniting all, Gentile, Jew, all of creation under Christ. And every time a grace bearer faithfully shares God's grace to someone in need of grace, it is a proclamation of victory over the evil forces arrayed against God. It is a battle cry. It is a way of, of God saying to them, it's finished. It's over. These are the evil forces over whom Jesus has already pronounced victor, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet. That's back from uh, back in chapter 1 of Ephesians. Now, in chapter 2, he kind of describes what these forces are doing. He says that they, they work together with the prince of the power of the air. They encourage the children of disobedience, those of us who, before we came to know Christ and those who, who may not be following Christ right now. He encourages the children of disobedience to fulfill the passions of their flesh. This all comes from Ephesians 2, 3, and 4. And carry out the desires of their mind and body, making sure that they stay securely tucked away as children of wrath. That's what these evil forces do. And they want to make sure that people stay there. And Jesus says to you and me, hey, you get to be part of releasing these people. You're my prisoner so that I can send you wherever I need to send you. You're my servant so I can send you wherever I need to send you. Jesus also said, you're my friend. You're my sister. You're my brother. And I love you as you do those things, but you need to bear the grace I've given you to other people. They need it so, so desperately. So to these evil forces, as we bear the message of grace, what Jesus is saying to them loud and clear is the jig is up. You're fighting a losing battle. And every time one of God's grace bearers shares God's grace with someone who rests securely in the enemy's grasp and they respond to him in faith, they are saying with him, joining the chorus, and it's finished, it's over. Grace wins every single time. Jesus' grace is not limited. Jesus' grace bearers are not limited. He sends us anywhere, everywhere, to anyone and everyone. We never get discouraged or defeated when we remember that we are a product of His grace, made to bear His grace in a world that desperately needs His grace. Verse 12 reads this way. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in Him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Now, Paul was talking to the Ephesian believers who didn't really know him that well. But he had suffered and was in prison because he, bared, he bore the message of the gospel. And, and he didn't want them to be discouraged. The discouragement could have come in a couple ways. It could have been sad for what happened to Paul. But they could have also been discouraged in that thinking, wait a minute, if I bear the gospel to other people, that's going to happen to me as well. It's true. If we speak up for our faith, there will be pushback. And increasingly in our culture and society, it's becoming more and more and more so. But do we back off? No. No. We step up because of what Jesus did for us and because we get to be part of his plan to revolutionize this world. We're not going to change the world by passing laws and, and electing the officials we want in office. They're all still human. We're going to change the world by bearing the grace that God has given to us to somebody else and helping them see their need for Jesus. 
and radically changing the trajectory, not of just of their life, but of their eternity. And we get to be part of that. The Apostle Paul, Juan Ezekiel Emmanuel, and Juan Cruz, Connie, Tim, Garrett, Tyler, every single one of us who name the name of Christ are all servants who have been given God's grace and have been entrusted to be part of this stewardship that Paul was entrusted with to take the message of the gospel to the world. There's not a person you will meet that does not need to know the Jesus you know. There's not a person you will meet who does not need some of God's grace today. I want to challenge us to, to make this a summer of grace. Inside your worship folder, you, you received um, an Oikos card. Now, we've used these before, and some of you still use them, and I hope that you will continue to use them. Typically, what we do with these Oikos cards is I, I encourage you to, to write down the names of coworkers or family members or people that you know that need Jesus. Oikos basically is the Greek word that means family or, or close relation. It's, it's the, those people, we, we define it as the 7 to 15 people that are closest to you that you have most influence with. And if you know people who need Jesus, um, you could write their names down in there. It gives you some ideas how you can pray for them and what you can do and look for opportunity to share the gospel with them. But here's what I want you to do today. I want you to, to think about the people that you've kind of percolated up in your mind today as we've talked that need God's grace this week and write their name down. Is there anyone in your life that you know needs God's grace? Write their name down. I'll give you a minute to do that. Now somewhere on that card, at the top of it or along the edge, I want to encourage you to write down a prayer that you can pray every single day. Pull this card out, pray this prayer every day of this week. God, thank you for your grace in my life. God, thank you for your grace in my life. It's on the screen as well. Please show me someone today who needs your grace and give me the courage to share it with them. Please show me someone today who needs your grace and give me the courage to share it with them. What could it look like to share his grace with somebody? Could be that there's a homeless person and you give them some food. Could be that you, you offer to pray with someone. Connie and I met a, a, a young couple in the community a couple weeks ago and they told us of something they do. They go on Wednesday nights, they go uh, ride the light rail. And they're just going to meet people. And it's a little awkward. You don't know them. They don't know you. And, and often what they will do is they'll just walk up to somebody and they'll say, can I pray for you? And you wouldn't believe the doors that are opening for them, doing something simple as that. Offer to pray for someone. Another way you could grace somebody is to visit a neighbor who you maybe know is, is suffering a loss or is going through a hard time. Another way to grace somebody is to share the gospel with someone from your orcas, someone who's close to you, someone that you know well, someone that knows you. Those are just some examples. I'm sure that as you think about the people on your list, there are people who need to know the gospel. Some, someone who needs the touch of God's grace. My challenge for every one of us this week is to share God's grace at least once each day this week. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your goodness to us. Thank you for, for the grace that you displayed through Jesus. Thank you for the grace you, you, you show each and every one of us, not just bringing us into your family, but also giving us an opportunity to share your grace with other people. 
Thank you for the way you've graced us with our fathers. And thank you for uh, this day that we set aside to, to say thanks. And thank you for being such a gracious and good God, a good father. May we walk in the grace you've given us this week. In Jesus' name, amen.